to doctors. No matter what we do, biology is king, patient selection. And the discussion that we had earlier on this morning with uh, Munir is how can we as physicians get more and better involved in screening, early detection of disease? How can we work with our colleagues in hepatology? I think there's a very interesting discussion that we could have as to whether oncologists should prescribe sorafenib or whether hepatologists should do it. Because when we think about the uh, dual nature of hepatocellular cancer, these are patients who are coming with two sets of diseases, usually underlying cirrhosis, which comes with its own set of clinical and management problems. And then in those unlucky patients, those who have a superimposed hepatocellular cancer, an area, again, in which we need support between the group of hepatologists and between oncologists. And I know that in our country, we have a big debate as to whether serafinib is a drug that should be prescribed only by oncologists or whether it should be prescribed very reasonably by hepatologists. This debate goes on. I think in terms of looking to the future, though, I think um, Professor Malina has given a very clear sense that the dominant research initiatives must involve the cancer community. But the, the idea about trying to capture patients earlier, uh, Peter Friend will discuss later surgical options, and all of those depend on earlier detection of disease. And again, it comes back to us capturing patients when their tumour burden is relatively low. So are there any new markers of disease that might allow us to interrogate the group of cirrhotic patients um, and, and to better improve the current diagnostic triad, which is usually underlying cirrhosis, alpha fetal protein, and um, diagnostic imaging is how we tend to detect and screen. And if we look at screening programs for hepatocellular cancer, in our country, these are ad hoc. They depend on the practice of different hepatology groups. And there's very little standardised information as to how we follow up our cirrhotic patients, which is surprising in a way because given the size of the burden in the Middle East, in uh, the Far East and elsewhere, you think there would be clearer follow-up programmes for cirrhotic patients, and those haven't quite emerged yet. So if, if we were stepping back and being public health doctors, what, what would a good tumour marker be? If we wanted something that we could apply to a diseased population of patients, in this case, cirrhotic patients, it would allow us to identify earlier than would be usually the case, patients who have developed early cancer that we could deal with in a much more effective way. And we'd hope that the tumour marker would be specific to the uh, cancer, absent in healthy tissues. It's ideal if we can measure it within the plasma because this is a much less invasive way um, of approaching our patients. Um, it should either be specific to the tissue or it should be sufficiently immunologically different that we can pick it up with conventional ELISAs, radioimmunoassays. We'd hope that the plasma level of the tumour marker would relate and correlate with uh, tumour burden. This allows us to use the marker not only in terms of early detection of disease, but following response to disease, as we've heard from uh, Professor Molina. It's ideal if the tumour marker, if the half-life is relatively short, because this allows us to see changes in real time um, as we treat the patient. Um, and, and we'd hope that the tumour marker would be present in the plasma um, at a detectable level, even when the tumour uh, uh, size was very small. <coughs> In some ways, I don't need to remind this group what sensitivity and specificity are, but just for completeness sake, sensitivity is a true positive rate. So it's a proportion of positives that are correctly identified as such. So can we identify the percentage of sick people that are correctly identified as having the condition? Is there a very strong correlation between expression of the marker and likelihood of having the disease? And specificity is a true negative rate. So we learn all about these in medical school, but we sometimes forget the precise definitions as we move forward. Um, apologies for the uh, quality of this slide. Um, but if we look at the different phases of biomarker validation for early cancer detection, then uh, phase one would be a preclinical exploratory phase 
which were seeking to identify promising markers. Some of the work that we're looking at, dysregulation of gene function, looking at messenger RNA profiles, but, but doing some discovery work around um, gene or protein uh, or siloprotein identification. Phase two is when we'd undertake case control studies. This is setting up a clinical assay to, um, um, uh, to look at the biomarker in patients with hepatocellular cancer and um, age, gender, um, disease match controls who didn't have the disease. Phase three is when we have a retrospective longitudinal study, which perhaps we have a large cohort of patients who've been attending the, um, the hepatology clinic, patients who've been followed up with cirrhosis and who've had serial blood samples collected. Going back to that biobank and patient cohort can give us a very useful means of um, it characterizing uh, any new biomarker that comes along. <laughs> Phase four would be prospective screening, in which we take a new cohort of um, a new cohort of cirrhotic patients, and we follow them prospectively. Um, and this gives us very clear definition, uh, longitudinally, of sensitivity and specificity. In phase five, these these studies are done only very rarely indeed. Would be if we had a randomised control to determine if the biomarker can actually reduce mortality in the target population. So we have a structured, complex um, um, trial hierarchy, if you like, about the quality of data supporting any biomarker. And at the moment, if we're looking at screening cirrhotic patients, the only biomarker that we have that has proceeded all the way through the different levels of study is alpha feta protein. We'll talk about the positives and negatives around alpha feta protein in a moment. And we'll talk about some of the new biomarkers, what stage they are in terms of development, and what promise they hold for the future. And, and again, what sort of size of study do we really need if we want to be able to prospectively validate a new biomarker in the setting? So the biomarker classes which have been most studied um, um, as potential early markers of transition from hepatic cirrhosis to hepatocellular cancer are embryonic antigens, proteoantigens, I'll explain more of those in a moment, <coughs> enzymes and isozymes, cytokines, and a range of different genetic biomarkers. And it's just to give you a feel for the emerging literature and biomarkers that I think we'll see becoming more strongly validated over the next two to three years. So alpha feta protein, um, something that all of us know, something that all of us use, has got these characteristics. Uh, it has a sensitivity of around 40 to 65 percent, specificity of 80 to 94 percent when we take a serum cutoff of 20 nanograms per mil. So although this is the only truly validated biomarker that we have, you can see there's a significant room for improvement uh, you know, in terms of the relative sensitivity um, of this test. Um, we know that the um, uh, positive rate of alpha feta protein in hepatocellular cancer is only about two-thirds of tumours, which is a significant limitation. We know of the many situations in which there can be false positives and um, false negatives turn up in terms of limitations with sensitivity. And there's some interesting work going on looking at different glycoforms of alpha feta protein. So alpha feta protein um, uh, is a glycosylated protein, and people are now looking at antibodies that can recognize different elements of the protein with sugar moieties attached to them. So if this is our gold standard, you can see that it's far from perfect. And that's why there's a lot of activity going on just now looking significant 
uncertainty might start to yield some interest, but an early stage in in um, early stage in its development. Similarly, with uh, glypycon three, sensitivity and specificity look in preliminary case control studies to be a little better than alpha feta protein. Uh, there's a marker called squamous cell carcinoma antigen, uh, which again, when used in combination with alpha feta protein, brings sensitivity up to about 80 to 85 percent and uh, maintaining specificity at high levels too in the mid 90s. Again, case control studies of only three to 400 patients, but showing real promise as to how we might combine them. And, and again, this tells us another story. It's unlikely that any single marker in its own will have specific, will have sufficient sensitivity and specificity. And it's likely that we're going to have to combine into a panel of different markers. Golgi protein 73, and tumour-associated glycoprotein-72, again, are markers which are being evaluated predominantly in China, Korea, and Japan. We know that China, um, vast country that it is, 50% of all the world's cases of liver cancer are in China. So there are very active groups there with large biobanks interrogating these samples. One of the problems about trying to build particularly in genetic work from China is that we are somewhat genetically distinct. So when we look at the pharmacogenetics of anti-cancer drugs, we can see there are differences between Caucasian and Asian populations. Um, and, and it's true that um, uh, drugs and biomarkers developed uh, solely in Southeast Asia may not be generally applicable to the wider population. Um, we are more genetically similar, we, um, than we are compared to our friends and colleagues coming from China, Japan and Korea. Um, this is another interesting uh, marker, uh, Des-Delta carboxyprothrombin. Um, these, are, these are enzymes, obviously. And when we looked at DCP, um, um, when we find a hepatocellular cancer, uh, more than five centimetres in diameter, this marker might add some good. There are, there are many, many publications in this. The problem is when the tumour size is small, the sensitivity and specificity of the marker drop off significantly. If you cause the daisies, these are enzymes involved in um, remodelling the sugar elements of any um, uh, glycoproteins. Um, specificity is relatively poor. And although it was being pushed very strongly by a large Japanese group, I, I don't think it has any significant future role as a biomarker in that way. One of the things, and again, I thought this came across well in Professor Malina's talk, is that increasingly as oncologists, we need to pay attention not only to the epithelial component of any carcinoma that we're dealing with, but to look at the stromal microenvironment What's becoming clear is that the inflammatory microenvironment of a tumour is as important a prognostic determinant as the somatic tumoral mutational landscape. So we've heard some brilliant talks about how mutations can drive proliferation, can drive metastasis, can lend themselves to being targets for treatment. And, and that, that focus of work is important. But increasingly, people are looking at the microenvironment of the tumour. Are there infiltrating lymphocytes? How many stromal cells are there? What type of neutrophils are there there? And a, a pro-inflammatory microenvironment with many stromal cells is a really bad prognostic factor. And within that, there may be really interesting targets for treatment. And transforming growth factor beta, the whole supergene family, is really, it's a really absolutely fascinating set of proteins. At early stage in tumour, they act as anti-oncogenes, <clears throat> but in later stage, TGF-beta is an immunosuppressant and definitely contributes to tumour growth and escape from immune control. And again, there's some really interesting work that in patients, particularly with cirrhosis from the background of um, hepatitis B virus, that um, TGF-beta-1, perhaps the most important of the TGF-beta supergene family, um, looks as if it may be an interesting, um, it may be an interesting cytokine to consider as well. 
uh, genetic biomarkers, um, I, I don't see the benefit of looking for alpha fetoprotein messenger RNA compared to the protein or its um, glycated um, isozymes, um, isoforms. So although people are looking at circulating RNA levels, I don't think that's going to take us much further forward. What is more interesting is looking at microRNAs. There's a big prognostic business in a way, starting around detection of these tiny fragments of RNA which can be detected in the plasma. And these are small non-coding regions which can block translation. So they're, they're mechanistically important within the cell and they can be measured quite easily in the plasma. And MIR-21 um, is the, um, MIR-21 is the uh, microRNA of particular interest that seems to be upregulated in HCC. And if we look at the uh, ROC, the receiver operated uh, curve analysis, sensitivity and specificity, a study of only 500 patients, but it looks really, really interesting. Um, so let me stop because time is always of the essence when we have these meetings. We would always say that prevention is better than cure, that we're building on what Munir has said. We know that we're making real and significant progress with molecularly targeted drugs. Uh, Julie Melania's fantastic talk. We know that we're active in trying to be much more selective about the patients that we treat. Um, still, some of the survival curves that we saw, particularly in HCC, um, are rather disappointing. Peter Fenn will talk in a moment about surgical management, which of course offers the only real potential chance of cure. And as part of our multidisciplinary team, I think we need better markers that allow us to detect HCC at an earlier stage. And in there, there is truth and a potential to aim for real cure. I think no single biomarker alone will be sufficiently effective. I think building multivariable models in which we look at different markers, um, uh, different markers, radiological imaging and so on, I think is going to be really important. And um, we put so much emphasis, so much emphasis on large expensive clinical trials of our drugs, I think correctly so, but we really need to think about more randomized control trials of some of these biomarkers for early disease uh, detection. And I have no doubt that improvements in biology, uh, improvements of understanding of biology and new techniques, particularly mass spectrometry, next generation sequencing, should allow us to identify novel early diagnostic biomarkers. Thanks very much. <laughs> so we'll talk.
one more effective uh, drugs in 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 influenza from the cancer. And uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, but it's a socialist that is not getting started. How do you think it's a difficult thing? They get the trial, and then we will have a case that we It's not even in the first one setting, uh, in patient to people are limited, and yeah, we didn't understand what's going on. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, very important issue. Uh, the way I, I work on drug development, so the work uh, the way I think prescription drugs in the argument setting is if you have an agent that is in the <coughs> static setting, it's probably going to be good in the argument setting. So here we have an agent that is the drug that is great in the metastatic setting, and now a study, a big study was done on the treatment of this therapy for some activities in the practical setting. The reality is that the, uh, the study was in margin of <coughs> This is a marginally positive uh, 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 disease. Uh, in the animal setting, there is no need for the immunization. Nothing like that was shown to have an immunization. And I think that's the reason why, even with such a marginal results, this was embraced by oncology as, well, let's <coughs> the population. The goal is that uh, for example, the patient is significantly better. And then the only 20% of the patients are going to be detectable, so we have very good chance of those patients to treat. And then as a result, the expected rate, which is pretty thin on those 50 percent If you're leaning, let's say, at 5 to 10 percent, then you're approaching that 50 percent chance of surviving the treatment. But I don't think it's the clinical immunization is so high to kill the tumors. And again, that's the reason why it's important to look at the reach of trauma, you know, molecular markers. If resected cases that, for example, have an agent and a mutation, I don't have any case of reading that mutation. And I would use the case of remain on marginal positive. Uh, we can take one more question. So now we can uh, switch gears. Uh, I would like to welcome <coughs> Professor Lewis uh, for the presentation on updates in the surgical management of FCC. Thank you very much, and thank you again for the invitation to speak here on the topic of hepatocellular cancer and update. Management of HCC really exemplifies team working and multidisciplinary management. Uh, but this time, of course, as we have just heard, the hepatologists are right at the front of it because this is a disease which is encountered by hepatologists. They manage patients with cirrhosis and liver disease in general. Uh, so I think it is entirely appropriate for hepatologists to be at the top of the uh, important list of people, but it's also surgeons and medical oncologists, interventional radiologists, uh, radiation oncologists, radiologists, pathologists. Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a multidisciplinary team meeting when it's really you. Uh, and particularly because of the potential for surgery. So the function of the multidisciplinary team, of course, first of all, is to establish the diagnosis. And here, um, pathology is rather more important than what, what we were discussing this morning. And radiology is paramount, and radiological skills are very, very important here. We then have to stage the disease and make the, the really very important uh, distinction as to whether this is a curable case or not. And if it's curable, how are we going to attempt to achieve this by resection, by transplantation, or by ablation? And we have to weigh up the risks and potential benefits of the procedure, and we have to think about adjuvant treatments. And if it's not curable, we have to think about non-curative treatments. So diagnosis and staging is based on the, on the uh, methodologies with, with which, of course, we are all very familiar. Ultrasound is primarily used for surveillance of patients at risk. This is uh, patients with cirrhosis, uh, typically every six months. Uh, of course, it can be difficult because cirrhotic livers have regeneration, re regenerative nodules, which can be confused very easily. Contrast enhanced ultrasound can be, uh, can be better. But in terms of investigating of a lesion under, uh, under suspicion, uh, four-phase CT scanning has got uh, reasonable uh, sensitivity and a high level of specificity. 
uh, but it's not good for smaller lesions. The sensitivity drops off very radically uh, as the lesions drop below one centimeter in diameter. Uh, gadolinium enhanced MR scanning has got higher sensitivity and high specificity. So it's a, a good method uh, for, for investigating lesions, any, any, any cause for concern. high rate of negatives, and we've just heard about the limitations of alpha feta protein and the other biomarkers from David, uh, and clearly what will be extremely helpful to our hepatology colleagues is to have a screening biomarker which had a higher level of sensitivity particularly. Uh, we all like to have staging categorizations, and this is the one that's been quite widely adopted or discussed in the HCC world, which is the Barcelona liver cancer um, staging scheme, which combines, it's designed to be sort of this change stage sense, at least I think that's the primary object of the exercise. So it's an early stage HCC is a single lesion less than two centimeters, no evidence of vascular invasion in a patient with a child QA. So um, very, a very low risk uh, for a curative approach. Uh, stage A, uh, progressively uh, higher risk, so up to three lesions, up to three centimeters, relatively preserved liver function, good functional status. Uh, B, multinodular, um, no evidence of vascular invasion, child QA A and B in good functional status. Uh, C, um, vascular invasion, extrahepatic spread, and stage D, as essentially decompensated cirrhosis, uh, not really suitable for, uh, for uh, interventional therapies. So let's look now at the treatment of HCC. Surgery is about either resection or transplantation. It's a binary option. Uh, and then we've got ablation, uh, which has uh, got more options, radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, high-intensity focused ultrasound, which is rather more de developmental at the moment, ethanol injection, cryotherapy, and stereotactic radiotherapy. Uh, we also have loco-regional therapy, of which uh, transarterial chemoembolization, or TACE, is the uh, most widely uh, practiced example, and uh, radioembolization using, uh, uh, using spheres, using uh, um, radiation spheres. Uh, and finally, chemotherapy with serafinib, which we, we've heard about. Uh, this is a, a summary of the treatment options for the different categories of patients. And it was part of a review from, uh, from the, the group at Pittsburgh. And I think it summarizes the various options rather nicely. So I have just reproduced it here. So uh, if we're into hepatic resection and or, 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 or liver transplantation, we're really trying to cure patients. Once we get into local regional therapies or ablation, uh, we're into the sort of gray zone between cure and uh, non-cure. But So we are hoping for the best with radiofrequency ablation, microwave, uh, et cetera. Uh, but we're aware of the fact that the chance of cure perhaps is, uh, is less. Embolization, uh, we're really into uh, either a holding pattern or the non-curative entrance, so taste, um, and then radiation therapy and systemic therapy, which are clearly not intended to provide a curative solution to the patient. So let's look first at treatment with curative in, uh, intent. So resection and transplantation are already mentioned. One would, generally speaking, take on specifically with an attempt to cure the patient. Ablation or combination therapies may have curative intent. So liver resection is the preferred treatment modality in, the, in, in patients who do not have cirrhosis. And it's also feasible in patients who have well-compensated cirrhosis, particularly patients child QA without portal hypertension and with a MEL status of less than 10. It is contraindicated in patients with advanced liver disease, that's child QC, um, and in most patients with child QB that have got portal hypertension, child QB is, is sort of the, the watershed, really. Um, 
the recurrence rate is higher in resection. And the reason is, even if the tumour is fully resected, the remaining liver is prone to new primaries. There's no, there's no question about that. And that almost certainly explains at least part of the higher um, recurrent disease rates in patients who undergo resection rather than transplantation. We'll come back to that later. Very important preoperatively to assess liver function. The Chow Pew score has been around since the 1970s. It's, it's quite impressive that it's still used, but it is. The MEL score has very much come into favor, particularly in the uh, liver transplantation world where it's used as a means of organ allocation as well as a way of assessing patients. ICG clearance, uh, again, has been, has been uh, validated and it's been around for a long time. And then good old clinical assessment, evidence of portal hypertension. What's the patient's platelet count? Do they have splenomegaly? Do they have ascites? Is there evidence of varices? Is there evidence of venous collaterals, for example, in the abdominal wall? Uh, those, those are uh, important parameters. So again, the issue of resection is all about what you're leaving behind. Are you going to leave a future liver remnant which is big enough for the patient to survive? Um, particularly, of course, in the context of a patient that does not have normal, uh, a normal liver. Uh, so uh, future liver remnants calculated using 3D uh, CT volumetry. The total estimated liver volume is calculated and the ratio between the two is the key, uh, the standardized future liver remnant. And the standardized future liver remnant in this environment uh, or at least 40% is recommended. So what about uh, an attempt to deal with portal vein, with small uh, uh, future liver remnants, as we were talking about this morning, uh, by portal vein embolization? Well, this is used. It is successful. It does increase the resection rate. It has, as a procedure, got a low mortality and major morbidity level. Uh, it is often used in combination with transarterial chemoembolization as a way of suppressing tumor growth at the same time as enhancing or causing hypertrophy on the other side of the liver. Uh, the procedure of ALPS liver partition, which again we discussed this morning, uh, has also been used, of course, in the context of an abnormal liver. Uh, the, the risks that we talked about this morning uh, become even more pertinent. And I think it is reasonable to make the statement that liver hypertrophy is less likely in a cirrhotic liver or a damaged liver. So the type of resection, anatomic versus non-anatomic, the, the general data would suggest that anatomic resection gives better results in terms of five-year disease-free survival. But the, the problem is that these are not uh, randomized control trial data and the studies may well be biased by case selection. In other words, uh, in patients with more advanced liver disease, they tend to have more non-anatomical resections, uh, et cetera. Uh, but th the general statement is that anatomical resection is advised if it is considered to be safe to do so, although non-anatomic resections with clear margins are clearly an acceptable alternative. Um, regional lymphadenectomy, the, the, it is clear that spread to regional lymph nodes is a common phenomenon in hepatocellular carcinoma, but the value of doing a radical lymphadenectomy is questioned. Uh, there is actually very little, if any, evidence of survival benefit. It does, however, produce useful prognostic information. It tells, tells us more about what's likely to happen to the patient. And I think a reasonable assumption, a reasonable interpretation of general opinion would be that selective lymph node sampling is a, a fair recommendation. Uh, in terms of outcomes, uh, obviously very much depends on case mix, but five-year overall survival following resection, resection of between 25 and 50 percent. The best case scenario, of course, is the small solitary HCC with well-preserved liver function having a liver resection, in which case uh, a five-year survival in excess of 50% is a reasonable expectation. Um, this is a meta-analysis, again, from the, uh, from reported by the Pittsburgh group of 13,500 HCC resections, showing, showing a perioperative mortality of 4% and a perioperative morbidity of 28%, which would not be un atypical of liver 
for resections in general, actually, although these are higher risk category. So let's move on now to look at the other big surgical uh, arena, which is liver transplantation for HCC. Uh, the, the word that always comes up in this context is Milan, the Milan criteria, uh, introduced in 1996. And just to recap very briefly, the Milan criteria states that the liver must have either a single HCC less than five centimeters or three or fewer nodules, none of which is bigger than three centimeters. There must be no extra hepatic spread and no evidence of major vascular invasion. If those criteria are adhered to, then the results of liver transplantation are comparable to those of patients undergoing liver transplantation for other indications. And the Milan criteria have become written very largely in tablets of stone. Uh, they are widely used as the standard criteria for eligibility for liver transplantation. Uh, outcome from liver transplantation, uh, results of liver transplantation for HCCs are very good in the short term. The perioperative morbidity and mortality is very low because quite commonly these patients, in fact always these patients, justification for a transplant is not liver failure but liver cancer. So their liver disease is less advanced, so they are, they are less sick in other words. Uh, if transplants are carried out within Milan criteria, and this is looking at an analysis of 14 studies, a uh, five-year overall survival of between 41% and 78%, the five-year disease-free survival between 60% and 80%. Um, adverse factors identified within Milan criteria, alpha feta protein above 1,000, and adverse tumor biology, poor differentiation, satellite lesions, microinvasion, and a number of host factors, including uh, co-infection with HIV and uh, HCV. What are the challenges to Milan? This is endlessly talked about in liver transplant circles. It's, it comes up at every liver transplant meeting. And the reason is that Milan criteria are far from perfect. It was a pragmatic suggestion 20 years ago. There is good evidence that some larger tumors do just as well. And there's also now good evidence that response to local regional treatment may be an important the time it was introduced. And the object was to maximize the benefit of a limited number of donor organs. There are many patients outside Milan criteria, no one disputes this, who would benefit from a liver transplant, but there simply aren't enough organs for them to do so. There's, so there's, there's, no, there's no dispute about that. And this is really important now that there are so many patients undergoing liver transplantation from living donors, because of course the shortage of donors comes a, is a completely separate question if it's a living donor who would not be planning to give their liver to anyone else. So should the, should the, the threshold for eligibility be the same under these two very different circumstances? But the, the, the bottom line here is that we need to select the right patients and then give them really good priority so they don't hang around on the waiting list for a year uh, waiting to get, to get metastatic disease. So extended criteria or beyond Milan um, has been, as I say, a talking point uh, for many years. And in particular, the, the uh, UCSF criteria, which have been Stipulated. And there are, there are lots of other uh, uh, beyond Milan criteria, which I'm not going to talk about because it, it actually gets a bit repetitive. Um, but the UCSF criteria are a single tumor of no more than six and a half centimeters, a maximum of three total tumors, none measuring more than 4.5 centimeters, multiple tumors with a cumulative don uh, tumor size or diameter of no more than eight centimeters, and a retrospective quite large, uh, 467 patient study demonstrated that if you use these criteria, there is no significant survival difference uh, from patients within Milan. Uh, and this is uh, demonstrating uh, what, what I've just said. So the M Milan criteria uh, you, you, see, you see here with a, uh, with a, a quite a good survival. Um, this is 70% um, out at however many years it is. Um, this is the UCF criteria, 
uh, slightly inferior, but not significantly inferior survival. And this is patients, so they, those are outside Milan, inside UCSF. And this line here, the dotted line, is outside both sets of criteria. So obviously, that's an important difference. That one, um, certainly statistically, is not. So what about downstaging HCCs before transplanting? Uh, this was an uh, analysis from Gordon Weeks and, uh, and others, uh, looking at eight studies, 720 patients, and, and downstaging was attempted by means of radiofrequency ablation or ethanol uh, injection or SIRT or TACE. Um, and downstaging was achieved in a, a range between 24 and 69 percent of the patients in these various studies. Uh, importantly, the outcome of a tr after transplantation was, was similar to patients within Milan criteria from the outset in four out of the five studies in which the relevant data were reported. Local regional therapy as a bridge to transplantation widely carried out. Uh, patients on the waiting list, uh, clinicians desperately hoping that they remain transplantable whilst they, their name comes up the waiting list and they gain whatever sort of priority uh, they're going to gain depending on which part of the world they're in. This is looking at a US multi-center study, 3,600 patients uh, within Milan criteria, of which the majority, 2,850, received local regional therapy and just under 500 did not. And there was no difference in, overall in the recurrence rate. Uh, but from within this study, it, it was clear that response to local regional therapy was a good marker. So it was a surrogate, presumably, therefore, for tumor biology. So the question, of course, is if we're going to invent something which uh, replaces the Milan criteria, should response to local regional therapy be part of that allocation process? Uh, and this is, this is uh, just demonstrating uh, what I've just said in terms of uh, recurrence-free survival and incidence of recurrence, uh, no difference between uh, patients that did or did not receive local regional therapy. Uh, alpha fetal protein in this context uh, does predict benefit. Um, and uh, I think you can, you can see that here from this, this slide uh, with a uh, looking at uh, normal and abnormal uh, AFPs um, in um, in these two categories. And complete pathological response uh, predicts good outcome. Again, de demonstra demonstrating the uh, local regional therapy um, with response, without response, and no local regional therapy. So no response is the worst group. Uh, with a good response, actually gives a better prognosis than not having lo local regional therapy. So the question is, is liver transplantation actually the better option for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma? If there are plenty of donor organs available, should we simply abandon doing uh, resections and offer transplantation to everyone with an HCC in a cirrhotic liver? This was a study from Will Chapman and colleagues uh, putting data together from five U.S. liver cancer centers over a 21-year period, 1,765 patients which were split, I presume, just by chance, almost exactly 50-50 between resection and transplant. And what you can see is that there is a clear difference patients apparently doing substantially and indeed significantly better. Um, but I've just underlined the important word, which is this is, of course, is a, a protocol analysis not an intention to treat analysis, uh, and that might make an important difference. This is a single center analysis from Mount, from Mount Sinai, five-year period, uh, looking at patients who are eligible for either treatment. Uh, these are patients with a solitary HCC, less than five centimeters, child's, child pew A or B, 55 were listed for transplant, 56 were, were resected as a primary intention. Uh, and, they, and the results, were analyzed on an intention to treat survival basis. And of course, it looks, uh, looks rather different because uh, undoubtedly the recurrence rate is higher in resected patients, as you can see here, uh, compared 
to the transplanted patients, but there's no difference in overall survival. And the reason for that, the clue, of course, is in the 30% of patients who were listed for a liver transplant but did not live long enough, at least not with, with uh, operable disease, to actually have a transplant. And that almost certainly explains that difference. And it casts into some doubt, therefore, the whole issue about whether transplantation is better than resection. Uh, so this is looking at um, a meta-analysis of seven studies, none of them unfortunately randomized, quality of evidence low, uh, which is not really showing a very big uh, preference for liver transplantation either way or, or resection either way. And I think, I think the problem is the number of variables in the equation and the lack of randomized evidence. So I, I mentioned earlier on that the availability of living donation, living donor liver transplantation does alter the picture somewhat because it no longer, we, we're no longer worried about what else we might be able to do with the donor organ. Could somebody else benefit more? With a living donor, nobody else is going to benefit if that patient does not receive it. And this is a, a, an, an interesting paper from the group in Kyoto of Kaido and Tanaka, uh, looking at 40 uh, transplants compared with 40 resections. Um, not all of them by any means, but only just over half of them were within Milan criteria. So it's a relatively high risk population of patients. Uh, and they match them carefully uh, with propensity scores uh, based on age, gender, child puce status, tumor number, tumor size, and alpha theta protein. So as best one can do in a non-randomized uh, controlled environment, these are reasonably well-matched groups. And what they demonstrated was that the survival was not significantly different, 63% for transplant, 53% for resection. Uh, and the five-year recurrence rate was lower in liver transplantation at 21% compared to 74% in the resection arm. Uh, and this, these uh, two graphs just illustrate what I've just said, which is the overall survival with no significant difference, but a very clear difference in recurrence. Um, so the conclusion from this paper, and remember Kyoto was, was the, the sort of, for a long time, was the world capital of living donor and liver transplantation, uh, was that resection was valid as an alternative to living donor liver transplantation, allowing for the donor risk. So although living donation is a relatively safe operation, it is not one without any hazard at all, and that's got to be set against uh, the somewhat better results in terms of recurrence. Um, RFA compared with resection. Um, RFA, we, we've talked about it already today, uh, is, is an effective means of ablating small tumors. Once the tumors start to become bigger, um, the, the local recurrence rate starts to go up. And typically, I think uh, three centimeters is a sort of point where most, most of us start to think that the benefits might be, be much, much less. Uh, this is, uh, again, a meta-analysis looking at a number of studies. Uh, looking, looking at overall survival over here, looking at recurrence-free survival here, and looking at recurrence rate. And the, the overall interpretation of this meta-analysis was that the results from RFA are inferior to resection, except for very early, i.e. very small, um, HCCs. And ablation compared to uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy. This is a, this is a study from uh, Milwaukee from the Medical College of Wisconsin, 784 patients comparing IMRT with ablation, uh, multiple different techniques for ablation. Again, a propensity matched analysis, no difference in outcome for smaller lesions, that's below three centimeters. Uh, ablation superior in larger lesions above three centimeters. And you can see that illustrated graphically along the bottom here. So as the lesions go beyond, beyond three, the, uh, the difference starts to become marked. Adjuvant chemotherapy, not really the, 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 the primary topic of my talk, but a study here looking at uh, serafinib as adjuvant chemotherapy compared with placebo, 900 patients uh, resected, ablate, uh, 214 patients ablated, and, and selecting only, the, only those patients from those two groups that appeared to have complete radiological response to either resection or ablation. Uh, big study, 28 countries, 202 hospitals, stratified by treatment, by geography, by child pew status, and by recurrence risk, and demonstrating 
no difference in recurrence free survival. So to conclude, management of HCC is clearly highly complex uh, and it's evolving, I think, uh, quite quickly. Um, as far as surgery is concerned, resection and transplantation are both important cornerstones and, and the primary uh, approach to cure. There are significant advant uh, advances in loco regional therapies, and these are uh, very worthwhile, particularly in patients who are not suitable for resection or transplantation. Systemic chemotherapy and radiation therapy uh, play supporting roles, and I think the nature of that supporting role perhaps uh, remains to be uh, completely established. Uh, but of course, as we all know uh, in this room, HCC remains a very important uh, cause of cancer-related mortality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent comprehensive review of conference topic. Um, before we open for questions, so we'd like to have you back over to two parts. Thanks, Peter. And that was very insightful. It's fantastically interesting. Why are there so few randomized trials? I mean, uh, you can sort of very yeah. honestly uh, start with the second scale for the female pool, um, sales of patient selection going on. Even there are lots of patients, <coughs> in very large cohorts, sometimes with more than a thousand patients. Yeah. Why, why not? Why not the surgical community get it back together and randomize it? Well, I think that I mean, it's an extremely good question and one which w many of us have agonized over. The first thing is that the operation or not to have an operation, it's quite different than a placebo or something. There's a very obvious difference. Um, and, and I think it's, it is genuinely quite difficult to persuade patients to do that. Uh, the other thing, uh, which I think, uh, sadly, I think is more important is that very few surgeons have a, uh, um, have a sort of null hypothesis. Um, I think sur surgeons, by their nature, have strong views. Uh, and, it's, uh, and I think that might be, might be an issue. I think we've really got to drive down and decide when there is uncertainty. So for example, not in the HCC world, but in, in the, in the uh, colorectal metastatic world, we are now conducting a randomized trial to compare ablation with resection of solitary lesions that are amenable for both therapies, the LAVA study. Um, it's recruiting very slowly, uh, despite the fact that all the evidence would say there is a null hypothesis here. We don't know what's best. My own view is that, is that ablation will play a bigger and bigger role, A, because the ablation technology will get better. And I'm thinking about technologies like, like HIFU, but also because I think the ability to monitor what's happening to them will get better. But we, we, we all need to work really hard to ensure that as these therapies become available, we strike at the right moment to get the right trials done. Because as soon as a surgical technique is out there, people don't like not to do it. It's, it's really interesting. I have no experience of it, is the simple answer to your question. Um, in the UK, uh, the loco regional bridge to transplantation approach is uh, nearly always uh, with taste, actually. Um, so it's it's there, it's used, but I I'm not I'm not really the the, the right authority to to say how well it works because because I don't have any personal experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't quite catch the beginning of that. Stiffness, yes. Um, well, liver stiffness has become, I mean, we need, we need some hepatologists in the room here. Um, uh, it's, it's becoming widely used as a way of assessing uh, parenchymal liver disease, uh, but I think it's more, of a, more as a screening methodology rather than a, uh, a diagnostic methodology. Is there anyone that would like to enlighten us more on the use of FibroScan and uh, other, other similar technologies? Um, 
I, I mean, I, I mean, in, in general, if one is concerned about, for example, the extent of parenchymal liver disease and whether a patient is likely to tolerate it, then a liver biopsy would be uh, conducted, certainly in our experience. And whether there are whether newer technologies such as measuring a, a formal objective measurement of liver stiffness will be able to replace that. I think that, that was the implication of your question, I think. Yeah. Yes, yes. Sure, yes. But, uh, but, but stiffness is a, sur is a surrogate for fibrosis, isn't it? Well, I mean, logically, there is a there is some issue. The patients with portal hypertension have collaterals, so so there is, there is a, a a tendency for blood to go to bypass the liver. But uh, I don't I doubt whether that explains the phenomenon. It may be quite interesting, first of all, to quantify the phenomenon and see whether that's that's a uh, whether the observation holds up. Um, I, I have a sense that you're probably right on that. Is, is that has that been shown in in Yes. The, pro the problem with doing this study is that we don't know what the instance of um, cirrhosis is. So we so sure we know what the instance of colorectal metastases is, uh, and we can certainly say what portion of them end up in cirrhotic versus non cirrhotic livers. But what we don't know is what it should because there are an awful lot of people walking around with cirrhotic livers that no one ever discovers. You know, just a comment, you know, if you look at all the data in terms of, uh, you know, the tumor in the liver and cirrhotic Okay, good afternoon. It's hard to be the last one to present, but it's happened to be a couple of times, so I'm used to be the last presenter. I'm not going to prelude. I'm going to skip a couple of the slides that Professor Molina have excellently presented. So talking about uh, management of um, hepatocellular carcinoma, I'm going to focus on the management of that this stage, which is stage A, or A to C, which is was actually the commonest type of um, the commonest stage that we see the patient. We hardly see the patient in the earlier stage, and these patients doesn't come to us, they come to the surgeon. 
So here, if we look at local regional therapy, I'm just going to have touch page on local regional therapy. Looking at the taste, we know that it have improved in the three years survival around 30%, and it have an objective response around 40%. So it's somehow it's a palliative treatment, but it's a good treatment. It can be also a purging, as Professor Friend mentioned, for uh, for um, transplant. What is the limitation of taste? We know that sometimes we have bilobal disease and we know that we give the conventional taste or the DCPs. And giving chemotherapy, it's not without any price. It's a price of having systemic side effect of the chemotherapy. That's why you cannot give higher dose. We cannot give bilobal injection at the same time. And there's another certain limitation. If you look all the guidelines, starting with the American, the ISIL, the ISMO, which is the European and the Asian guideline, all have the same contraindication. No, extra uh, no, no exahepatic disease, no vascular invasion, and good liver function. So they are all agree that we have a limitation for the taste. So looking at, oh, they were trying to look if we have a prognostic for these, a prognostic predictor for a patient, you're going to apply taste. If you look to pilorubin, albumin, tumor size, alpha feature protein, they try to make a score from A to D. So A will be the best and does reflect on the survival. So the best score will have 25 months and the worst will have almost almost only six months. Even if you leave the patient without anything, they will live for the six months. The art score, which is I think that intelligent way of assessing patient for chemobilization, we don't apply it in clinical practice, but I think it's a very visible way of doing this. So you assess the patient, child score, no exahepatic, no vascular invasion. You give the first taste, you do the CT scan, and you do you give a point based on the following. Absence of radiological tumor response, AST, child score, and you get the point. If you have 0 to 1.5, uh, so you're good, you can consider the taste. If you have more than 2.5, you should, you should consider alternative treatment. And when they, they look at the cohort, it does correlate with the survival. So the score from 0 to 1.5, they have 20, 28 months, where the score, more than two, they have a lower survival rate. Same thing for child A patient. We'll switch gear for radioembolization, like we do in our center a lot of radioembolization. We use the Sarasphere, not the Therosphere. Why? Why we're, we like that radioembolization? For two things, because it's bypassed the limitation that we have on the taste that we can do, even if there is some vascular invasion or portal vein, uh, vein thrombosis, we can do the bilobal. It's a bit safer, safe than, than, than taste. And if you look at the median overall survival, it's 12 month, we do discuss this at these cases in the tumor board, and this is the prognostic we look at each patient. Performance status, tumor burden, INR, and extrahepatic disease. Even if we have an extrahepatic disease and we think that the bulk of the disease is mainly in the liver and it does affect the patient, sometimes we apply care to this patient. Which, which treatment that we need to choose, whether CERT or taste, some people they said this is superior. There is one trial over nine years, they, it was non-randomized, but they compared both. So in all patients, chair was better, 20 months versus 17 months. But for the PCLC child um, uh, P, uh, the, they were like equal. So <coughs> which one to choose? And I think we have to choose, we have to customize per patient. If you have patients with both of the thrombosis, if you have bilobal disease, you need to infuse both. You can go to chair rather than taste. So we'll go, if we stage migrate, we go to uh, the stage C. Here, what we, our goal, like a medical oncologist, we start with, this is old, old trial, which is the old dexorubicin, which was the standard of care, and what there is no much of improvement. Then we'll shift to the standard of care. I think the SHARP trial is a landmark for any patient, anyone who treats HCC. So everybody's showing the SHARP trial because that is the standard of care. It's given overall survival. It's been tested on the Western and the Asian with uh, overall survival on the, in the SHARP trial was 10, on the Asian was around seven months. And if you look here, this is the survival curve. We know that it's, it's modest efficacy, but it's still it have significant p-value. Looking at the subgroup analysis, whether in the SHARP trial or Asian specific trial, all go toward benefit with Nixavag looking at the extrahepatic, microvascular invasion, or both. The guidance trial, that trial done after approval of Nixavar, and they're trying to look at 
if, if we can give the treatment on, on a higher child score, if you look at that, when you go with the score high, the survival will be very low. And I don't think anyone will treat a child C, child B. For me, I don't think they are the same group of patients because early B, they are doing better definitely from uh, late B. And I do treat patients with an early B. And we did our uh, retrospective analysis in our center, 240 patients. They were treated with Nexavar, and we have the majority of our patients was an early B. And they did, in terms of overall survival, as good as the child A in the SHARP trial. So I think these patients can be, can be treatable. This is for hepatitis B, showing the survival curve of 11.7 months. Looking for first line, other than Nexavar, because I think whoever treating patient with HCC, we get poor. We need a new medication. We need to try something different. So all the trial, which are the, the surge trial, this is Orlatinib plus Sorafenib, uh, compared with Sorafenib placebo, no, no, no improvement. And I think people, they, 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 they remember the trial of Avastin plus Orlatinib from the MD Anderson, with a modest effect, but that's what the only hope uh, for the patient with HCC. This is the PRESC, which is Pravenib. Well, that's it's an anti-angiogenesis. Same, didn't show any improvement. Sutent, Nexavar was su superior. Lanifem, this is an, uh, a GET inhibitor and a multi-kinase inhibitor also did not show any that improvement. So this all are negative trial. I'm gonna skip this because Professor Molina Present this is this is present in the last ASCO, the reflect trial, which is head to head. It was done as non inferiority. It's a big number of patients, around almost like 500 in each in each arm. And if you look, that overall survival was very much similar. In the subgroup analysis, there is a couple of of of, of uh, subgroup analysis go to uh, toward the benefit of lamvatinib. Progression free survival was double in lamvatinib compared with sorafenib. And this is, again, the first plot for progression-free survival. We look at most of the line go more favoring of lambatinib. This is the time to progression. It was also superior in lambatinib. It was almost like nine months versus 3.7 months in Nixavar. Again, that was showing here in this diagram, which is still, I cannot explain it, that patient with low alpha fetal protein, they do better than the patient with high alpha fetal protein in the lambatinib arm, but this is a good patient. Looking at the second line treatment again, we have the uh, we have Rolimus being tried in the second line. Again, Pravenib would try in the second line, and again it's a negative trial. We'll go to um, they try to look as a target, like the patient with the C-meta inhibitors. This is Zambatinib, which is a C-meta inhibitor. This is a phase two trial published a few years back, and it was positive in terms of patient with with a high with a high met, they will have a better survival if they was treated with tembatinib. This is a second line trial. This is a phase three trial that was encouraged by the phase two that published uh, that uh, presented in the ASCO of 2017, and they were looking to randomize patient to tembatinib or uh, placebo only for the C met uh, high patient. And they biopsy patient uh, before and after Nixavar, an amazing patient with the high mid uh, before Nixavar, it was 35% and reach up to 70 after treatment with Nixavar. And they considered plus two, more than 50% present on the tissue as a positive for high mid. Looking at the overall survival, the curve are like uh, attached to each other, so it's, a ne it's negative. Same thingy for progression-free survival, so it's not match for the phase two trial. If you look at the subgroup analysis, it was negative in everything except for patients who develop neutropenia and pericardio. This is a lot one known side effect of this drug. Again, the other selective was also negative. Ramirsimab in a second line. This is a phase two trial, the REACH trial. Uh, I like this trial because I think on the reach to we're gonna hear a good um, good result. Uh, here it shows the survival curve for all patient. You think it's negative trial? If you look at the patient with high alpha feature protein, the, the the curve separated and the survival almost doubling. So we're waiting for the reach to. This is a real patient of mine who failed Nixavar initially, or I think he did not tolerate Nixavar. 
Um, at that time, we did not have the immunotherapy and we did not have the approval. I gave him remdesivir. This is after a few cycles of remdesivir. The tumor almost shrinking in a good number. I think around 40% shrinking in the tumor. The resource trial, which is, as Professor Molina said, this is a drug was made uh, as similar to uh, to sorafenib, but the lesser side effect. We know it's approved on, on, on patients with colorectal cancer as a third line of therapy. Here there are comparison between placebo and regrafenib in a second line. And if you look, I'm not really sure if this line is clear, but if you look at this, this is the overall survival. It is 10.6 months versus 7.8 months. So it is superior. <coughs> this is the subgroup analysis again more going in favoring of regrafenib. This is the position of free survival again, again of three months compared to placebo. And again, the subgroup analysis, it's more <coughs> toward the favor of regrafenib. This is time to progression. Again, for regrafenib, it's gained like three months over placebo. This is also the subgroup analysis for time to progression. This will show you how a uh, patient on regrafenib. If you, you just concentrate and modify these criteria. So one, pa one, person, one patient has complete response, partial, 10%, and stable disease, and 54%, which is a good number at the second line. So they look at the patient who received Nixavar with variable, because we know um, as an oncologist that not all of the patients can tolerate the 800 milligram per day. So if the patient receive the, the actual dose or the lower dose, they will do the same in terms of overall survival. There is no difference whether they have the actual dose or lower dose. This is to just to, to show you all the trial on summary. The only positive trial, the sharp resource, and the rest are negative, and I think we should wait for the REACH trial. Immunotherapy is, is the coming age, and I'll be presenting that early morning, so stay tuned uh, for the immunotherapy. And I'll, I'll just give a few, just summary for what, what, what we've learned today that we know taste a standard of care for the intermediate stage. I think we should apply the tool for prognostic on when we consider retasting the patient. We still, we don't understand. We have a couple of data about combining taste and Nixavar, but we don't have a data of combining Certix and Nixavar. Still, we're missing this part. And the systemic therapy show good function. We still now have a good second line therapy. Remersimab is, I think, is a promising drug, and immunotherapy probably it will be the standard of care. Maybe it will be in the first line setting. Thank you. Have a weekly tumor board just for HCC every single weekend. We discuss, we have the interventional radiology, pathology, radiology are there. So we discuss this piece on these, these factors. Sometimes we need to, to see the patient again if it is under other service. If we can apply any kind of therapy, then the decision will be like the group decision based on these factors. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is a brilliant way of doing. So every presenter they have to do and go do this calculation and present it. It will be easier for the group to make a decision. Yeah. 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 
Okay, how do we treat? It depends on the, yeah, we, we follow the standard, um, except in one thing, like I don't treat only child A. I treat also early, um, early P, like up to seven. Um, when you look at uh, the, the first line of therapy, that will be sorafenib. Now my second line of therapy will be nivolumab, will be immuno, immuno, um, 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 checkpoint inhibitors. Um, in the past, I've tried regrafenib as a second line. Uh, to be honest, in one patient, not in a lot of patients. But my experience with Nixavar is huge. So um, I do believe it's a good drug because if you look at the data for people who develop, achieve like complete response, we have in our group of patients, four patients achieve complete response. And if you look at the data in the whole, in the whole, in the whole, um, in the whole um, um, universe, it's only like 14 uh, case report about complete response. And I try to study why these patients have a complete response. Honestly, I could not like connect the dots uh, for this. So my standard of care is so often a nivolumab. Um, certain patients with high alpha feature protein, I might push for remrisumab because I think the drug have no side effect very minimal side effect with good tolerance and good efficacy. We have, it's, 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 it's huge. Like in, in our center, like we're seeing like around probably 80 to 100 new patients. Uh, and most of the people they refer to us, if they are rejected from another hospital, I don't turn any HCC patient. I see all, most of them. Um, I cannot answer about liver transplant because um, I'm not really sure how much they are doing per year, so I am I don't know this information. But we do have a transplant service, and we have like four transplant uh, surgeons there. But how much they are doing, I don't know. Yeah, so I have two hmm? questions. The first one is in case uh, versus uh, Sorry? Uh, the uh, care. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 Wanted to do care because we think now it's less stock. But now we have not used the standard case, we use DCDs. Yes. Uh, we use a bit patient portrait, DCD, we do it as an outpatient okay. setting. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they don't have actually uh, the side effect that we used to do in So mm -hmm. that's what you think. That's my first um, question. Let me just uh, tell you the second question and then you can try it. Sure. Uh, so uh, this, there was a report from the SEAL that was about 2,000 patients in infection carcinoma and I, I, those are usually the, the, the fact that what, what, what happens to all patients after the trials are being published. Mm -hmm. The trials are very controlled Selected. rather than for, for treating patients. Then, what happened to all the patients when you do the treatment, you see it in the post-marketing uh, review, and the steel database, and I see it, is very, very really helpful. The survival for patients with the treatment uh, 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 child A, child B, was only four months. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what was the uh, first? <laughs> first uh, yeah. Um, for me, I, um, this is like, I would say, like an observation uh, from the patient that we've treated. Like, I feel that the patient who received care, they have a better response than uh, this. It is, it is operator dependent. It depends on the radiologist because they go super selective, how much they are confident of doing this. But I feel like it's more effective. And we have, like, this is not randomized, but it's so that it's more, more, um, uh, more superior. Um, I maybe I tend to more toward uh, sarcosphere rather than um, the TTs because I, I think that is they are responding better. In terms of side effect, I totally agree with you. The DCPs we have lesser side effect, but we don't do like you. We do admit the patient, but I think this is a good thing to to propose that it should be a day surgery. Uh, we admit all patient for TTs um, for for that for the next of our. Uh, I would be very comfortable saying that um, looking at our data because we have like 200 patients, it's only one center. I know it's a small number, but we do have patients that they survive longer. So the survival for our patient was around 10 months in early P, not only A, 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 if it was, they were better. So I, am, I cannot explain it, but I think next 
the more probably it's a good drug because you might lose the patient very fast if you just carry on with all the side effects. And I, I tend to stop and give, uh, do some modification. I do treat liver decompensation. I don't send patients to hepatology back to hepatology. I do treat them and sometimes get them back to on the drug. Um, but still, like 10 months, I don't think that's enough. But 